So hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, good morning, oh, and yes, uh, my name is Paco Pangalangan. I'm here today actually wearing two hats. Uh, the first as the executive director uh, of Stratbase ADR Institute, and also the second one as the lead convener for Democracy Watch, one of our two partners for this uh, this morning's event. Uh, you know, that said, I'd really just like to welcome everybody. I'm, I, I think I have the, I'm the face that you've been seeing over the last couple of minutes uh, on your screens. Maybe, I'm not sure. And I want to welcome you to, the trans, to our virtual town hall discussion for this morning entitled Transparency and Accountability, Regaining Public Trust Through Democratic Governance. And as I said earlier, the institution, the Institute has organized this with its partners, Democracy Watch and Transparency International Philippines. Um, that said, I wanted to officially, officially kick off the event by passing you on to our president, the president of ADR Institute, Professor Dean Domenico. Sir? Thank you, Paco. Uh, I hope I'm, my audio is good. Yeah, loud and clear, Paco. Okay. Good morning to everyone. Good morning to our speakers, our guests, our participants in this uh, virtual town hall that has been organized by Scott Base. ADR Institute with our civil society partner, Democracy Watch and Transparency International Philippines. Allow me to share a couple of slides as I welcome you to our program and to our uh, discussion. We chose June 30 because it's exactly at this time, four years ago, that we had the inauguration of President uh, Rodrigo Roa Duterte. And I remember encountering this word Dutertismo from one of the articles of a partner also of the Institute uh, who speaks in a lot of our programs also, uh, Professor Randy David. And I'd like to use, uh, and I've used this term of his, Dutertismo, because that's what President Duterte promised four years ago. Radical change. As he articulated frustration, discontent, and even desperation of regular people. Spoke of a dysfunctional government, unresponsive public services, and even shocked us with his language. Some even use the term beyond civilized behavior already. But here we are, four years after, and what we have tracked before this pandemic is that the public continue to put trust on its leadership. Is it political will, maybe? Is it this deep personal connection with constituents where we said he had polarize Philippine society by emphasizing the us against the them, referring to intellectuals maybe in this program right now as the them, and the us referring to majority of the people, or the us, the his followers against the Dilawan, or is it about the ability to define some key visions for the country? He came out strong at the start of the year, but something that we have really used as a thought process in, our, in the Institute is that we try to look for what we call surprises. And this surprise is what I call today the virus from Wuhan or the virus from Wuhan, China. It has impacted our lives, not only socially, but also economically, but more so, I believe, political. And we have, we have failed to understand its possible political implication. The past few weeks since the lockdown of March 17, our team in our research and intelligence uh, group, or the Strat-based Research and Intelligence Group, have tried to identify these risks in what we call the new normal. And as I share these slides to everyone, 
this is also the guide of our institute on what topic to discuss, what research to do, what trends to monitor. This morning, I'd like to focus on what I call a risk, which is COVID-19, possible COVID-19 corruption, and how it can affect Philippine democracy or even the national election of 2022, which is two years from now. So since March, or since the start of the year actually, we have, we have tracked this virus. But I wanted to start with our tracking in March, because that's when we got locked down as a nation. We accepted the lockdown as a key health in initiative. And I want, you to, I want you to look at the extreme right of what I'm presenting. It's the cost that came with the lockdown also, the interventions and the loans necessary to fight this virus. We've tracked it from March, saw the cost of dealing with this virus rising in April, saw it rising more in May, and here, as we end June and enter the last two years of President Duterte, we have seen the release of over 352 billion pesos and government contracting foreign loans of 282 billion pesos or 5.65 billion dollars. And this is where our fear is. Because what we have feared, the highly personalistic person of, of governance of President Duterte was based on his charisma, was based on a polarized political environment. We have failed to build institutions that values transparency and accountability. Now we see massive movement of funds we see government, maybe for some, as they deal with this emergency, saw the opportunity to skip accountability measures and democratic procedures under the guise of emergency powers. But what I believe we need is responsive governance founded on the principles of transparency and accountability to surmount the economic and health challenges that we face in the wake of this virus from Wuhan, China. And it is with such core principles and matching institutions to cultivate them that our government should cooperate with various sectors of civil society and creating a culture of responsive public service and a mature democratic system in this next or last two years of the Duterte administration. Am I saying it just now as we host this virtual town hall? But it's something that I've written in various commentaries. Spoke about it just a few days, or wrote about it and spoke about it to groups. Right after our lockdown, in the commentary I wrote for Philippine Daily Inquirer, I said the other virus is corruption. And the government and the private sector needs to work together to promote greater transparency and accountability in governance and build institutional integrity. Because when I saw the Bayanian Time to Heal Act and the budget that was being debated and then approved into law and the fast tracking of processes in the name of emergency, I really felt that we have to be very careful. Then I wrote about it again when the lockdown was dragging, first day of May. And I said, only with good governance can we harness the full potential of the country's talents and resources to defeat the pandemic and seize the opportunities for a reboot or a better way of doing things to be able to move forward. Just last Friday, I said, maybe it's time to even use technology that through responsive and collaborative governance, 
we will be able to efficiently and effectively address citizens' real needs. And here I raise the issue of, are we equipped for e-governance? Are we equipped to make things more efficient? Are we equipped or have we allowed even the private sector to help us build the digital infrastructure to at least make our systems of government more transparent and more accountable? Sorry if I've taken more time, but this is something passionate for me. I've spent 26 years teaching in a university on these issues, and I continue to look for this kind of institutional reforms, administration and administration. Again, thank you for joining all of us. And I know that we will have in-depth discussion and in Strat-based ADR Institute, in Democracy Watch that I have helped found in 2013. We hope that this is just the first step that we can collectively build this institutional reform beyond government, but among us, because this is what Philippine society wants. Again, thank you, Paco, for allowing me to welcome everyone. You're welcome, of course. Thank you. Thank you as well, sir. Thank you for your welcoming remarks. Uh, I think you've sufficiently opened our, uh, officially kicked off our event for today, our virtual, uh, virtual town hall discussion for today. And um, we'll go on to our speakers. We have an exciting uh, program ahead, I think. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to make sure that everybody, uh, all of our viewers, know that they can use the Q&A function of Zoom to type down their questions and we'll see them. Uh, the speakers as well, we'll see them and they can answer you directly or we will collect them. We have a team in the background collecting the questions and we'll ask them uh, to the group. We'll throw them to the group after during the Q&A session. Uh, okay, so that said, we'll move on to our uh, the main event for the for the morning. Uh, we, our first speaker uh, for today is uh, a former a former associate justice in the Supreme Court, who, after retiring from the court, did not less rest on her laurels, and served as our ombudsman for uh, for, for uh, some time. Uh, sorry about that. Um, next up, we have Honorable Conchita Harpio Morales, ma'am. Yeah. Are you there, Pop? A pleasant morning to everyone. I greet you all from a safe distance as we gather virtually for a round table discussion on transparency and accountability. Many thanks and high praises to Stratbase, ADR Institute, and Democracy Watch Philippines, as well as to Transparency International for spearheading this important event. I was placed in this cluster to share some perspectives from the government side, albeit I'm no longer a part of government, given that I have already retired two years ago. Nonetheless, I'll try my best to prefer some few in, or few insights on the topic. Indeed, these are unprecedented times. This catastrophe is a first of its kind in recent times, given the novelty of the global dilemma others are positing that we can afford to give our leaders some slack, considering that nobody had heretofore dealt with this gargantuan problem of this magnitude. I must say that it is, however, not an excuse for incompetence. Neither is it an excuse to run roughshod of the fundamental laws. In fact, it is in these dark times that competent leaders are tested under extreme circumstances. Abraham Lincoln was attributed this relevant dictum. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Along these lines were the words of American lawyer, Robert Green Ingersoll, when he said, Nothing discloses real character like the use of power. It is easy for the weak to be gentle. Most people can hear adversity, can bear adversity rather, but if you wish to know 
what a man really is, give him power. That is the supreme test. The people should watch closely over the power wielders exercise the extended emergency powers under the Bayanihan law on top of the vast array of already existing government powers. Public officials thus need to account for the use of the power granted by the people. The people deserve to check whether these public officials pass or fail this test. If they seriously fail and commit abuse of such power, they should not go unpunished. A UN ODC report recognized that, yes, there is the need for urgent action to prevent economic and social collapse, but the lack of sufficient accountability and oversight mechanisms in the allocation and distribution of economic stimulus packages increases the risk that corruption and fraud will weaken the impact of the measures being taken and resolve in a shortfall of desperately needed aid reaching the intended beneficiaries, impacting the least powerful among the population. Moreover, this pandemic highlights the need for governments to rely on hard science in crafting public policy. Governments can no longer ignore science like what some global leaders have been doing with respect to the issue of climate change. Sooner or later, nature will have its way, whether human beings like it or not. For one, Congress cannot amend or repeal the law of physics or the established precepts on medical microbiology. We need to come to terms with the need to comprehend scientific data and learn from new discoveries or best practices from leading countries in order to come up with data-driven responses. One can be comment, interestingly noted, that the pandemic did not break our system. It merely exposed an already broken system. Perhaps, to some extent, the observation may be true. The series of unfortunate events may have led us to realize how poor the delivery of health services is in this country. This goes to show that the health sector has witnessed years of neglect. Aside from yielding to other budgetary priorities, the health sector is one of the victims of the overall corruption problem. Public funds, which should have been spent for hospital beds and other medical facilities, ended up in the pockets of some people. Not to mention the narratives of overpriced medicines and equipment. It is about time that the country should invest more in the health and well-being of its citizens. It is about time that this country should aspire to become a medical heaven itself amid the decades-long diaspora of nurses and medical professionals abroad. Researchers at SOAS, University of London, or the School of Oriental and African Studies, led by Professor Mostak Khan, opined that corruption and governance constraints will not only undermine treatment responses, but also result in cycles of unsustainable lockdowns and massive economic deprivation. The article cautioned about lockdowns and massive problems. It also cautioned about incidents of padding or procurement contracts, leakages in distribution of emergency food supplies, and chronistic appointments in newly formed response agencies. In fact, an article from the <clears throat> Council of Foreign Relations on Foreign Relations revealed that 14 governors and 10 mayors in Colombia are being investigated for fraud vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19 contracts, and another 400 emergency purchases are being investigated in Brazil, while Bolivian authorities have just arrested their health minister. Moreover, calls for investigation have risen in Italy over a government contract 
with BioCrea to produce face masks in the United States over a contract with a political connected company's failure to deliver urgent medical supplies and in Kenya over the misuse of World, Fund, World Bank funding. Meanwhile, Hungary is just one of many governments to introduce gaps, gags on the media. Despite the precariousness of the situation, authorities around the world are using the crisis as a pretext to enrich themselves or extend their power. It cited a report by the U4 Anti-Corruption Resource Center, which explains, and I quote, what we do know from previous pandemic and global crisis is that they provide a perfect environment for corruption to flourish and that this guarantees further loss of life, deprivation, depreciation in public trust and dysfunction in society that persists much longer than the crisis itself." End of quote. The CFR article continued, but we must and we do know what sort of government is necessary. Governments with high accountability, transparency and trust are proving to have more success, responding credibly, responsibly and effectively. In terms of the Philippines, anti-corruption work, the same challenges of the pandemic scenario have similarly posed serious limitations. As we all know, court hearings, including that of the Sandigan Bayan, have been disrupted for the past months. Rappler has reported that the Antigraph Court resumed normal operations last June 1, except that there have been no hearings for the month of June because the office of the special prosecutor is not ready to go to trial resulting from this pandemic. The news report added that the ombudsman fact-finding investigation was on a standstill during the lockdown in view of the limitation of transport and the risk of infection in going out to interview in the field. Even with the easing of the quarantine, these challenges persist and call for long-term adjustments throughout the bureaucracy. The anti-corruption effort might go slow in terms of process, but it should never go slow or never go soft in treating blatant cases of corruption. Professor Khan provided, however, a glimmer of hope when he posited that once we start getting out of this mess, there may be a real appetite for more serious reform. In weathering this storm, I believe the people in a post-pandemic scenario were mean serious business this time around in holding power to account, especially since their lives and livelihood had been at stake throughout the duration of the pandemic. While doors are being shut almost everywhere, the door to transparency and accountability to the people should remain open. We, the people, should remain vigilant. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, ma'am, for, for your strong statement. But... Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Speaking, sir? Okay. I think that means yes. So therefore, I'll now move on. Thank you, ma'am, very much. I will move on po Pleasure. to our, yes, thank you, po, to, uh, to hear some perspectives naman from our speakers from the academe. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Sherwin Ona, who's the chairperson of the Political Science Department of De La Salle University. He's also, he also happens to be a non-resident fellow uh, of Strathbase ADR Institute. Uh, Dr. Sherwin, are you, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, so a pleasant good morning to each and everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, virtual RTD. Again, my greetings to, of course, our speaker, uh, former Ombudsman Conchita Carpio Morales. Thank you very much, Madam, for that very insightful presentation. And of course, a lot of thanks to Sir Dindo and of course to Paco and the rest of Stratface. Now, of course, um, 
as uh, Ombudsman Morales uh, said a while ago, uh, this is really an extraordinary and unprecedented event, not only for the Philippines, but of course, globally. And um, if you are a present day leader, a national leader at that, you should know that your leadership will be judged by how well you manage or mid mismanage this pandemic. And this, of course, in your mind, should be an opportunity for you to define. And this is a defining moment for you. It should be a defining moment for your leadership. But again, unfortunately, the Philippines, as Sir Dindo uh, rightly put, after 100 days of lockdown, we as a nation failed to get ahead of this virus. We have seen more or less leadership without details. Aside from having a lack of specifics, it has failed to present a clear vision of where the country is heading. And of course, in, in a paper that I wrote for Stratbase, I, I interpret this as uh, as having to resort to a highly securitized, highly militarized approach to the pandemic. And of course, it has its advantages, but clearly it has its disadvantages for such type of response promotes a tactical view, a tactical approach, rather than, as uh, Justice Morales pointed out, a science-based, data-driven approach. Another danger of a highly militarized and tactical response is its inherently lack of accountability and transparency, which of course can lead to abuse and of course corruption. I would like to focus more on leadership. Um, the president has branded himself as, um, as a very decisive leader uh, as um, uh, Professor Manhit said earlier, the Dutertissimo brand speaks of a decisive leader. But in the case of uh, COVID-19, government in general has failed to show, in my opinion, has failed to show leadership, uh, especially during the crucial period of February or January, February, wherein it fa failed to prepare the country for uh, the onslaught of the coronavirus. This is unlike other countries, uh, for example, Vietnam and South Korea, which took uh, preemptive measures to control the spread of the disease. And during this time as well, January, February, government in general initially downplayed the virus. In terms of communication, I think um, the messaging uh, failed to adopt a very consistent and effective tone. Um, if you look at the speeches of the president, most of it is mixed with other messages. Okay? Um, for example, when he discusses about uh, COVID-19, uh, he mixes it with other issues like uh, the drug war okay? and other issues. And of course, generally, this has failed to provide a clear strategic direction where are we heading as a nation? In three months, uh, what is our situation? What will be our situation? Again, um, again, some some critics are also pointing that um, the presence of the president, uh, he, uh, the need for him to be seen, is also lacking. And lastly, I would like to point out to the approach of the government adopting a command and control structure. There is a big problem to this approach because it's, uh, it does not promote flexibility. It does not promote uh, independence. It does not promote incentives. It promotes top-down. Okay? And this is very uh, top-down approach or top-down management. And this is similar, very similar to how we approach disaster risk reduction in the Philippines. And um, data in this type of scenario is treated as actionable intelligence. Again, this is a very tactical-oriented response and misses the public health 
public health aspect of the problem. So uh, my take here is really to, uh, judging from my, uh, what I've written from Stratbay, for Stratbase, to really uh, expand the national security toolbox. This means that aside from public safety, aside from a militaristic approach, there should be a co consideration about public health, more public health, and adoption of good governance practices. And um, part of this national security toolbox is really to hammer on the need for resiliency. Uh, as uh, Sir Dindo pointed out, there is really a need to strengthen institutions, maintain public trust, and define new roles for citizens and households. And last but not least, there is also a need for us to adopt digital transformation, which should be hammered by the government now that we're in entering a new normal environment. Our structures, our, uh, our governance practices should be able to adopt to this new, practice, uh, new environment. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Sherwin. Yeah, it was really interesting. And personally, I think I'm going to uh, squeeze in a question later for you about that data-driven digital transformation that you had mentioned. Uh, so watch out for that one. <laughs> okay, uh, so, but uh, next up, so thank you, Dr. Sherwin. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Ronald Mendoza, the Dean of the Ateneo School of Government. It's, uh, Dean Ron, it's good to see you again. Welcome back. Thank you, Paco. The floor is yours, Apo. Yes. Uh, let me begin by thanking Ambassador Del Rosario, uh, Dr. Dindo Manhit, Paco, Christina, Claudette, uh, our colleagues and friends from ADRI, for the kind invitation to share some thoughts on the state of democratic governance in the Philippines today. Let me switch gears a little bit and uh, talk less about COVID-19 and talk more about uh, some of the challenges we already knew we had uh, going into 2020. Uh, and that's how I interpreted the theme of uh, today's discussion. So uh, I would like to revisit some of those issues. Uh, it's not that they didn't, it's not that they went away. It's just that uh, COVID-19 just overtook a whole host of issues that uh, we were already struggling with uh, in terms of institutions, corruption, a lack of transparency, and so on and so forth. So specifically, our topic for today focuses on transparency, accountability, and governance. In the literature and in the practice of reforms, the simple narrative uh, goes as follows. Uh, first, transparency and freedom of information regimes provide an enabling environment for citizens to engage their government and hold it accountable. Second, institutions of accountability, such as the Ombudsman, the Judiciary, but also Congress, press home the accountability process, and this is very critical. And then finally, the democratic governance is strengthened as checks and balances keep power in check. This is basically the entire theory of change as far as uh, the functioning of transparency and accountability in democracies like the Philippines. And perhaps Dr. Bob Clitgard of Harvard and Rand Policy Institute framed it, framed it best. Corruption equals monopoly of power plus discretion minus accountability. So democratic governance seeks to address corruption and impunity very simply by creating checks and balances to break the monopoly of power, by creating institutions to limit and temper discretion, and by triggering the accountability process just outlined previously. Now, this elegant narrative works in countries with strong rule of law. And this is precisely the area weakened by populist regimes. So Dindo had a very powerful uh, introduction to our uh, event today, and, and I fully agree with him in terms of the extraordinary pressure against uh, institutions during these times. Law and order underpins any well-functioning economy. In recent research, law refers to the sturdiness and impartiality of the legal system, while order refers to the widespread observance of the law. In canonical models of the market economy, upholding the rule of law, as well as respecting property rights and contractual rights, are some of the key ingredients for the efficient functioning of markets. An already large body of literature asserts that weak rule of law is associated with anemic foreign investment flows. For instance, in a recent international survey of over 300 multinational corporations by the Economist Intelligence Unit, 
the rule of law was among the top three considerations in making FDI decisions, with almost 90% of respondents indicating it as essential or very important. Rule of law matters for economic development and protecting the sanctity of contracts and upholding human rights are both part and parcel of the rule of law. It seems odd to have to emphasize this point. Some eco economic reformists still seem to believe the Philippines can achieve development even under a regime that fails to uphold the rule of law and more specifically, fails to protect human rights. According to some, as long as we protect the sanctity of contracts, our economy will grow. This is an actual person who said this. This is a false dichotomy and an overly narrow and shallow understanding of the rule of law and institutions. In a recent opinion piece, Dr. Raul Fabella of the UP School of Economics very succinctly summed up the international evidence on the factors boosting foreign direct investments. It is clear from Dr. Fabella's analysis that lowering the corporate income tax rate is not the main constraint the Philippines presently needs to address. Instead, the focus should be on key constraints, including infrastructure, high power costs, red tape, and unstable regulatory regimes, as well as the weak rule of law. Presumably, some progress has been made on many of these other factors. Yet perhaps the area with the least progress in the last four years, or even recent regression, is in the rule of law. It is interesting to note here the recent brouhaha over the decision by water concessionaires Manila Water and Mainilad to waive the 10.8 billion Philippine peso payment from the Philippine government based on the recent arbitration ruling in Singapore. The arbitration tribunal decided the Philippine government should pay Manila Water 7.4 billion and Mainila 3.4 billion due to losses they incurred when they were prevented from raising water rates in the past. As noted by at least one private sector official, the decision to waive the ruling was a direct result of political pressure against the concessionaires. Regardless of how, how one assesses the tribun tribunal decision, these extra legal maneuvers sent investors into panic, with the Philippine stock market losing almost 130 billion or some 2.5 billion US dollars that same week. The entire episode was a potentially reputation damaging precedent, casting a shadow over the sanctity of contracts and the rule of law in the Philippines. Can tax cuts and incentives reform mask the erosion of the rule of law in investors' eyes? I think not. Sanctity of contracts is one thing, but what about human rights? There is now growing evidence that the importance of rule of law to economic development is not merely limited to its direct application to property rights. In particular, upholding human rights is critically important to boosting investments and development. Hence, this dramatically expands the canonical view of economic theory, which often only has a narrow emphasis on rule of law for contract enforcement. Recent research on FDI inflows, inflows uncovered evidence that human rights violations may provide a highly negative signal for foreign investors. In a panel data analysis of 165 countries during the period 1977 to 2013, researchers from Europe found evidence that condemnations by the UN Human Rights Commission and Council tend to diminish FDI inflows. In fact, the results suggest that countries condemned by the UNHRCC for human rights violations are associated with a roughly 49% decline in FDI inflows. Let me just repeat, repeat that. Countries condemned by the UNHRCC for human rights violations are associated with a roughly 49% decline in FDI inflows. Both conceptually and in practice, it is difficult to imagine how one can cherry pick the development of institutions to produce the rule of law. Indeed, countries with generally poor human rights records often also have generally weak institutions. In economic development discussions, the strength and independence of the judiciary is often left out of conversations, as if one can operate a strong, sustained economy with inclusive growth without a functioning, efficient, and trustworthy judiciary. Again, this is a false dichotomy. 
a professional and independent judiciary that can uphold human rights is likely the same one that stands to uphold the sanctity of contracts and property rights most effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mendoza. That was a very insightful uh, talk that you gave. I especially like the, how you pointed out how complex actually this issue is, how it's political and economic aspects of it. Uh, our next speaker, thank you, sir. Uh, our, our next speaker is uh, our senior fellow, a uh, senior fellow at, uh, at the De La Salle Institute of Governance and is also a trustee and program convener, uh, more importantly, of uh, Strat based ADR Institute. Uh, Dr. Kiko Magno. Uh, who's the convener of our governance program is here to, to share some of his insights. Sir, Dr. Thank you, Papo. Uh, let me share some slides. Good morning. Uh, my presentation is on transparency, accountability, and public participation. Uh, Professor Larry Diamond, in an article facing up to the democratic recession, has already indicated that democracy has been in a global recession for most of the last decade, and that the Philippines uh, can be seen in this context. With uh, COVID-19, another article written by uh, Professor Larry Diamond on democracy versus the pandemic characterized the present crisis as also a crisis as mentioned by Professor Manhit, uh, Dindo Manhit, as a challenge to institutional integrity. The coronavirus is emboldening autocrats the world over. According to Freedom House, the Philippines scored in the, in the Freedom in the uh, Global Index uh, 62 out of 100 in 2018. It's gone down to 61. In 2019, so there is a, a trend towards the diminution of uh, exercise of freedom in the Corruption Perception Index of uh, Transparency International in 2019. The Philippines scored 34 out of 100. indicating that the Philippines is below the average in the Asia Pacific, uh, most countries scoring 45 out of 100. And among the ranking of countries, the Philippines is 113 out of 173 countries, indicating that there are challenges when it comes to freedom and corruption uh, prevalence. And yet in the Open Budget Index, uh, budget transparency in the Philippines compares favorably with other countries in the Asia Pacific. In fact, the Philippines is scoring above the global average. This is an indication of budget transparency reforms over the past uh, 10 years have been uh, moving forward. So we can attribute this to the budget reforms, especially in the executive branch, where budget documents are now publicly, publicly available. Uh, in, based on standards 
of the Inter International Budget Partnership, there are eight key uh, budget documents that should be made available to citizens. And the Philippines is uh, moving forward in this uh, direction of transparency. But we have to contextualize this in the different uh, institutions that provide opportunities for public participation. As I indicated, uh, transparency practices are improving in the executive branch, especially the Department of Budget and Management, but lagging in the legislature. And in the Supreme Audit Institution or the Commission on Audit, there have been critical practices that, that have been mainstream, especially the citizen participatory audit. The Philippine Constitution, of course, recognizes the important role of civil society organizations or non-government organizations. Because for accountability to take advantage of transparency improvements, there needs to be citizen action and we have to consider the, the budget cycle as the different domains where citizen participation can be uh, incorporated. From budget preparation to budget approval, budget execution and budget accountability. So these are just examples of some of the budget reforms and practices over the past few years. And I indicated in this table, uh, different budget reforms with civ civil society participation from budget preparation, legislation, execution to accountability. Some of these uh, practices have been discontinued like the budget partnership agreement and bottom-up budgeting, although certain elements of bottom-up budgeting have been incorporated in successor programs like assistance to disadvantaged municipalities. It's now called the assistance to municipalities. While the citizens participatory audit has been integrated in the programs of the commission on audit. What I'm saying here is that there are uh, institutional reforms where civil society participation has been recognized while over the past few years this may have been uh, stopped or maybe became inactive but it doesn't mean that these practices are gone forever so in this time where we are uh, rethinking the, the value of co-production uh, of the importance of citizen participation in uh, promoting institutional integrity, we have to revisit these efforts. So it's very important to look at the, the practices that have been uh, developed over the years, like the Concerned Citizens of Abra for Good Governance pioneered the practice of Bantay Lansangan or Road Watch Infrastructure Monitoring. Uh, in fact, they had this Bantay Lansangan project as early as 1992 in partnership with the U United Nations Development Program and with the support of the Commission on Audit. Uh, the only problem at that time was that the Commission on Audit was not ready to really mainstream the uh, the practice. So it took a number of years before Bantay Lansangan has uh, become the prototype of, uh, of the citizen participatory audit. So we have other practices like public expenditure tracking and procurement monitoring, code NGO, Coalition Against Corruption, uh, Government Watch, uh, the example is Bayani Escuela and Textbook Count dealing with uh, infrastructure monitoring and procurement monitoring. At the local government level, you have Naga City People's Council, their practices on participatory planning and budgeting. And this is uh, very relevant. Uh, mention was made of uh, 
the need to monitor procurement of medical supplies. And now Frel had a, a program before on procurement monitoring of medicine, uh, delivery of medicines. You have uh, Palawan Advocates for Good Governance and Participatory Planning, uh, Procurement Watch and Transparent Accountable Governance Program. So, Bantay uh, Lansangan, uh, a Roadwatch project is an example of uh, civil society monitoring that has been mainstream, so to speak. Uh, this originated from the efforts of the Concerned Citizens of Abra for Good Government. government. I had the privilege of working with, uh, we call her Manang Pura Sumangil, uh, who is, was the founder of the Concerned uh, Citizens of Abra for Good Government. And because of their work on infrastructure monitoring, uh, applied to Abra, these are the findings of this uh, project. Most government projects claiming to be completed in Abra were actually just beginning or were halfway through the construction phase. As a result of that monitoring, 11 officials from the public work sector were suspended for dishonesty and misconduct. And the Commission on Audit partnered with the Concerned Citizens of Abra for Good Government and carrying out participatory audit auditing, later replicated in other parts of the country. Uh, ANSA EAP, uh, is now using heavily the citizen participatory audit that was pioneered by the uh, Concerned Citizens of Abra for Good Government. As you can see in the website of the Commission on Audit, uh, the citizen participatory audit reports are now uploaded in their website. What are the enabling conditions for transparency and accountable governance to uh, be effective, political culture and democratic space. There is a need for enabling rules and legislation. The need for open data, for example, citizens access to reliable public documents and data. Uh, for example, the transparency seal in national agencies and the full disclosure policy at the subnational levels. The right to information. Right now we have the freedom of information in the executive branch, but we don't have a law yet on freedom of information that will apply for all government agencies in the country. Budget support for open data infrastructure, uh, because uh, providing data is not just a matter of willingness to provide the data, but having the, the platform and the needed investments for open data to be available to the public. And capacity building for government agencies on public participation. Because uh, uh, public participation is not just a desire, it's also a skill. So it requires competence to, to uh, make public participation work. So uh, the move for, towards open data has been uh, going on for the past several years, but it's really a matter really of pushing data and making it available to the public. There's also a full disclosure policy portal, and this, is, uh, this emanates from the local government code provision that local governments should provide access to uh, financial information regarding the operations of the local government. But of course, uh, data doesn't act on its own. There has to be warm bodies doing the, in the analysis and interpretation. So it's very important the very important role of what I call the information intermediaries and think tanks, policy institutes can play that role of providing the data analytics and the assessment that will guide citizens in 
demanding accountability. Transparency became a supply-driven exercise for LGUs. Compliance with the full disclosure policy became a barren exercise when there are no users of the publicly disclosed data. Uh, there was a joke before that uh, for compliance purposes, local governments provided uh, the, uh, or set up uh, uh, portals, but they are not uh, actually uh, available. Uh, the, the entire document was not made available. The weak local stakeholder uptake to use open government data stems from lack of awareness, capacity, incentives, and knowledge of citizens to concretize the everyday benefits of open government. So very important to consider the ecosystem of uh, data provision and data analysis. One way to improve the use of uh, full disclosure policy data is to bring in local knowledge stakeholders and develop platforms that can serve as inf information intermediaries in translating open government data into knowledge products. Let me go to the enabling conditions on the demand side. The availability and accessibility of independent media that enable the public to engage in discussions pertaining to public issues. So a very balanced reporting setup is important. Uh, resource persons that can provide uh, nuances to public issues uh, based on evidence-based analysis, capacity, legitimacy, representativeness, responsiveness, and accountability of civil society actors, utilizing data, infomediaries, and policy think tanks, and very importantly, public participation and legislative oversight mechanisms. In a democratic system, uh, we do have a set of elected officials from uh, both the executive and the legislative branch. So uh, public participation to maintain uh, checks and balances and to provide good legislative oversight is very important in this regard. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wagdong. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, I think uh, my, my main takeaway from that really was uh, that we all have a role, the, the whole of society approach really to it. To open governance, and we all have our part to do. So, so society has to be in government, uh, private sector. So, thank you, uh, Dr. Kito. Um, next up, uh, and to just wrap up the uh, academe perspective, last but not least, of course, for the academe is Dr. Ador Torneo, uh, who's uh, Dr. Ador Torneo is the director for the Institute of Governance at the LSE. Uh, Dr. Ador, uh, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning. Uh, uh, first, uh, thank you very much, uh, Paco uh, and the uh, President Professor Ling Dolman here from Strathface uh, Alberta Rosario Institute, and uh, our uh, colleagues, uh, uh, former Ombudsman Pachita Carvey Morales and colleagues Dr. Sherwin Ona, Iron Mendoza, and uh, Dr. Francisco Magno. So I'll uh, mostly limit my, my discussion with COVID 19 as a uh, uh, focal point for discussing the how to restore trust. Uh, in the content meeting governance. So, now, um, it would be a gross understatement to say that COVID-19 has uh, caused and called misery uh, across the globe. Indeed, most governments have been caught by surprise in the speed by which the pandemic has spread. In the beginning, uh, many governments were situated similarly, you know, frantically mobilizing efforts to halt the spread. But the more interesting and relevant matter for our discussion this morning is what? happened since then. Uh, the past couple of months have seen sharp differences in terms of both governance and outcomes. In some countries in the world, uh, governments have successfully brought uh, COVID-19 cases under control, uh, marked by decline in the number of cases and little or, new, uh, uh, little or no new local transmissions or infections. Many countries are already reopening their economies and attempting to restore a semblance of normal. You know, and what 
whatever uh, the current situation al uh, allows. However, in the other parts of the world, COVID-19 cases are still rising unmitigated, spreading largely undetected, and increases in cases have little or no end in sight. It is uh, unfortunate that the Philippines belongs to the latter. So despite imposing one of the longest lockdown periods in the world, the WHO, the World Health Organization, finds that the Philippines has the fastest number of new COVID-19 cases in the Western Pacific region, which runs contrary to uh, pronouncements uh, in Malacanang that the government is winning this fight. Um, meanwhile, uh, most ordinary citizens have had to uh, contend with the grave consequences of our inability to bring COVID-19 under control. Uh, at least 4.9 million people have lost their livelihoods, entire industries, and large swaths of small and medium sized enterprises and businesses have closed. Uh, day by day, workers and offices struggle with the severe lack of public transportation and the prospects for economic revival still looks bleak. The uh, national government has been very defensive regarding its performance, but this is the thing. At the moment, no one knows exactly where we are in the course of this pandemic. We still argue, are we in the first wave, second wave, or we are heading as the national government engages in incremental policy making and every several weeks we have to uh, take in a new policy or a new uh, area classification. No? So uh, the COVID-19 pandemic provides us with a good perspective on governance as it is practiced in the Philippines. Like many other governance uh, challenges, it is complex with multiple dimensions. It has political, it has economic, it has health, science, social, cultural, and environmental, among others. In the health science front, much is not known about this disease, and we are learning new things every day. Nevertheless, uh, uh, we know enough to show that many governments across the world has uh, actually uh, managed to flatten the epidemic curve and even reduce you know, transmissions to zeros. Now, um, of course, um, we are still in the midst of this pandemic and uh, practitioners and scholars still do not yet fully understand what makes for a successful response. This is something that we are closely monitoring and, and studying. In some cases, the, the outcomes appear to be a result of various factors, including, of course, governance, uh, resources, technology, geography, and even luck. But what we have observed uh, from countries that have succeeded in reigning the pandemic under control, and those who are still uh, seeing for this, uh, uh, cases surging uh, is of interest. No? Uh, first observation that I made is that uh, governments that made decisions or making decisions based on medical and scientific evidence seems to be faring better and inspiring more public trust compared to those that are making decisions based on uh, short-term economic and political uh, calculations. This can be seen in the uh, disparity or the timeliness by which governments uh, responded. Governments that acted early to contain the, the disease and enforce physical distancing, wearing of masks, invested in mass testing, contact tracing, quarantine, and in some cases travel restrictions and lockdowns have been more successful in general in containing the pandemic and restoring some semblance of normalcy and governments that delayed uh, public, uh, that the governments that delayed taking action. I think uh, um, in restoring public trust, no, um, the medical, the, the scientific, no, even economic rationale behind much of the interagency task force in the Department of Health directives need to be made clear and understandable to the public, the Filipino public. No? So in, in other governments, um, national leaders have taken a lot of efforts to explain very clearly you know, uh, the situation, explaining the rationale uh, of uh, the policies that uh, they, are, uh, they, have, uh, they are undertaking. You know. At, uh, in our current situation, uh, the, the challenge is that the national government is expecting citizens to comply with many policies, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the understanding of these policies is not always very clear. If uh, people are expected to make sacrifices, they must understand clearly what it is for, why they have to do it, and how they have to do it. This is a matter of uh, effective public health communication. Um, I also observed that governments that were able to secure public trust and cooperation fared much better in securing public compliance.
compliance when it came to wearing face masks, uh, practicing hygiene, social distancing, and voluntary compliance with quarantine restrictions. Now, uh, elsewhere, governments who had not been able to successfully secure public trust and cooperation have had to rely on the coercive power of the state, this place of force, and even intimidation. And results have generally been mixed. Now, uh, I think that um, um, in uh, restoring public trust and securing public cooperation, my view is that uh, we should treat this uh, pandemic for what it is. No? It's a governance and health issue for which much of the solution is medical and science and the success of which relies on voluntary citizen compliance and solidarity. My view is that this should be the focus of government communication. Uh, instead of treating this pandemic as a peace and order issue and uh, securitizing the issue and behaving as if uh, citizens are the enemies, what we call the Pasaway narrative. You know? um, government must shift the tone in terms of communication, and try to encourage the public to be an ally in this uh, in addressing this challenge. The other is uh, the matter of transparency. Governments that communicated uh, with their publics in a clear and transparent ma manner tended to win public trust and secure public cooperation better. No? Leaders that admitted the problem, communicated the risks, outlined effective mitigation efforts, and spoke with one voice have generally fared much better than governments that have multiple speakers or leaders who have downplayed the threat, have publicly reversed their policies, uh, and even looked for I don't know, scapegoats. Uh, in South Korea Foreign Minister Kang Kyung Hwa explains that the key to their success has been absolute transparency with the public sharing every detail of how the virus is evolving, how it is spreading, and what the government is doing about it, warts and all. Now, government, uh, citizens do not expect perfect governments or perfect leaders, but they expect transparent and accountable ones. In terms of accountability, uh, leaders and governments that have displayed openness to feedback, the ability to respond and adapt to the changing demands of the situation, and display consistency and impartiality in implementing policies have demonstrated far better results and gained public uh, trust than those who did otherwise. No? Uh, governments and leaders who uh, display hostility to feedback and uh, uh, unwillingness to adapt or respond, as well as those who demonstrated selectiveness and partisanship in enforcing the rules, compared much worse in terms of uh, cases. No? So um, my, my view here is that the national government must exert every effort to restore trust in the implementing agencies, in particular, the lead agencies, the Department of Health and the Interagency Task Force. This is a health issue and within the expertise of the DOH. No? I, I regret that um, uh, the DOH, uh, which is the uh, where citizens look up to, has um, had a um, constant source of uh, concerns and confusion in particular, for example, the, the, the confusing data uh, that has been, uh, that is being released, uh, the speed by which it is responding, and the terms, uh, the kind of leadership that has been displayed in the past couple of months. I think that to restore public trust, uh, some change must happen no? uh, within the DOH. Something must give. Uh, it has been five months no? uh, since uh, uh, many governments have uh, started taking efforts against this pandemic, but the DOH is still seemingly going at the same approach that it has at the very beginning. As well, uh, I think that the public needs to see more health experts and scientists in the interagency task force. While I do not doubt the leadership and the competence of the uh, uh, current leaders, former retired military generals on security matters, and their ability to mobilize and deploy personnel, which was essential in the early stages of this pandemic. Having them hold all of the key positions in putting them front and center, this long within the pandemic may not be the best approach. You know? um, this pandemic requires medical expertise and science, as well as democratic values of consensus, cooperation, and collaboration. It is not unquestioning compliance. The kind of governance that we need at this time is one that is collaborative. 
As the Council of Europe notes, the effectiveness of the response to the COVID-19 emergency greatly depends on the level of coordination and cooperation between the different actors involved. It also depends on the willing and active participation of citizens and civil society. So that regards not only the confinement measures, but also direct involvement in voluntary work aimed at sustaining the response effort. COVID-19 is as much a governance issue as it is a health concern. Governments have little or no control over what deadly pathogens nature throws our way, but it has full control on the kind of preparation and responses it takes and the manner by which it responds. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Adoro Torneo, for that. Indeed, uh, yeah, that was a very interesting uh, a talk and it was very insightful. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, okay, uh, actually, we, we just rounded out the, the academe, uh, or the perspectives from the academe from our speakers. Uh, next up, we have perspectives from our stakeholders, uh, both from, most of them are from civil society. And just to show you, you know, that we truly are this new normal, it's digital transformation. Our first speaker uh, uh, is uh, Mr. Coco Alcoas, Executive Director of Makati Business Club and Integrity Initiative Incorporated. Unfortunately, uh, there was a scheduling conflict um, that, and Mr. Alcoas is unable to attend, but he has sent in a video which we will play for you right now. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a testament really to, to this new normal that we're in. Uh, so here we go. Good morning. I'm sorry I can't be with you today. I really wanted to hear from this learned panel. I messed up my Zoom meetings and presiding over our own activity at the moment. When Dindo invited me to do this, I wondered about our premise, regaining trust through democratic governance. Because unless there's a survey I have not seen yet, trust in the current administration remained high despite what some consider a retreat from democratic governance. It's not yet clear if the COVID-19 crisis will affect their ratings in a way that previous issues have not and or reduce their authority to respond to COVID-19 and other issues. So for our purposes today, let's imagine a future administration. Let's imagine that it's not an extension of this one, or at least, or at best, a partial extension because of the usual realignments come election time. How does that administration keep, regain, or gain, for the first time, trust in government? We are saying here, that it is via transparency and accountability, which usually mean government activities and decisions are open and officials can be and are held responsible. I assume my colleagues have probably discussed the central issues, so allow me to share three ideas from further afield. First, that democratic governance and accountability don't just revolve around a system of laws and practices meant to ensure good public service, they also refer to direct, practical, and even immediate public service. Second, that as we strengthen transparency and accountability laws, we also have to strengthen the legal system that will enforce those laws. Third, that transparency, accountability, and democratic governance don't speak for themselves. They need to be communicated much more effectively in this era of alternative facts. First, direct, practical, quick wins for the people. When I think about transparency and accountability, it seems very far from trust. Trust is earned. That means the government must deliver something to get trust. And in our polarized and probably economically poorer environment post COVID-19, that something cannot just be the promise of good government. It has to be jobs now, mobility now, more affordable food now. After all, embedded in the phrase democratic governance is governing for or serving the people. And a public servant's first accountability 
is to deliver what's needed now. Second, transparency, accountability, and a strengthened legal system. You all know better than I do how our transparency and accountability laws need to be amended and what new laws are needed, such as a freedom of information law or new libel laws, both of which are among MBC's advocacies. But these laws don't matter if agencies can't be made to enforce, comply with, or respect them, if suspected wrongdoers can't be investigated or prosecuted. This means we have to raise the quality and professionalism of our prosecutorial and judicial officials, including professionalizing how they are appointed and probably raising their pay more. I'm told this has already drawn more young lawyers to join the legal system. The BSP is exempt from the salary standardization law because of its central role in our economy. As our individual and collective rights and freedoms have come under attack, I believe the courts should be exempted too because they are so central to our democracy. Third, communicating democratic governance amid alternative facts. All the efforts of a future administration at democratic governance will not win trust in a post-truth alternative facts world. The current administration has run an aggressive, sophisticated comms operation. They have the means and motivation to continue to do so. A future administration needs to decide on its limits and prepare to deploy the comms infrastructure they will inherit. One final thought on communication. The next president needs to find teaching moments to talk with us about transparency, accountability, democratic governance, democracy, justice, the rule of law, integrity, public service, and other ideals. We need re-education because over too many decades, too many collaborators, cronies, and corrupt businessmen and politicians have destroyed our trust in the system. In the end, transparency, accountability, democratic governance are just ideals until they're in the care of an enlightened leader and an educated citizenry. Thank you very much. you're on mute. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, I was just saying that that was um, Mr. Koko Alkuas, the executive director of the Makati Business Club. Uh, next up, we have Judge Dolly Espanol, who's the chairperson of Transparency International Philippines and one of our partners for today's virtual town hall discussion. Judge Dolly. Um, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning, morning everybody. Folks. And thank you very much for uh, this opportunity to be able to show that uh, Transparency International Philippines is, is still at work. Although uh, we are uh, in a state of hibernation, because of uh, unfavorable condition, yet we are always uh, alert when it comes to providing information regarding corruption. Uh, this morning, I have prepared a paper that is very, very long, uh, expecting that the original uh, a time given me will be up to 20 minutes. But uh, last night, I have hurriedly pared it down uh, such, in such a way that I will not dwell on all the activities that the TI Philippines have embarked on. Uh, but uh, for my uh, purpose of uh, connecting to the topic that we are discussing today, let me read to you uh, the basis of our uh, analysis 
on how governance is faring under the present situation. The definition that I'm going to provide is the constitutional uh, provision in Article 11, Section 1, which reads, public office is a public trust. Public officers and employees must at all times be accountable to the people, serve them with utmost responsibility, integrity, loyalty, and efficiency, act with patriotism and justice, and lead modest lives. Against this, we are going to uh, present to you what the I Philippines has done for the last 25 years because we are celebrating the launching of our uh, organization on August 25 this year. Uh, during our existence, we have conducted several studies on the status and nomenclature of corruption in the country uh, by conducting seminars, workshops, roundtable discussions, organized and hosted international and local conferences on the same subject. Such being the case and considering the priority given to solving the menace of corruption under this administration, the nature of public office and the behavior of public officers manning the government responsibilities to the government has timely engaged our uh, concern. Uh, with the composition of our uh, board of trustees uh, representing the economy, uh, academe, the legal uh, profession, uh, bankers, and uh, several others, we have uh, come up with uh, the following uh, activities, uh, to name a few. Uh, we, were in, we conducted the National Integrity System, a forum on reforms and governance in business, jointly sponsored by TI Philippines and the Southeast Asian Parliamentarians Against Corruption. Seminar workshops conducted in nine out of the 13 regions on the subject of building integrity in democratic governance by enhancing the culture of patriotism and good governance. Implemented with UNDP funding through the Civil Service Commission as the primary agency that implemented the Anti-Red Tape Act of 2007. Uh, the Philippines and CPAC conference on the topic action program to fight corruption was enhanced by the definition of one of the British parliamentarians, Sir Edward Burke, Burke with his definition, corrupt influence is itself the perennial spring of all prodigality and, all, and of all disorder. It leaves us more than millions of deaths, takes away vigor from our uh, arms, wisdom from our council, and every shadow and authority and credit from the most vulnerable parts of the Constitution. In analyzing the performance of public officers, we have to know the three natures and that are intrinsic in public office. One, public office is a public trust. It is not to be understood as a position of honor, prestige, and power, but a position of rendering service to the public. Two, it is not a property. The holder thereof may, be, may not claim, claim vested interest in the right to hold uh, the office, uh, not, and this office cannot be disturbed by legislation. These are the offices otherwise known as 
the, uh, the commission, the constitutional commissions that include the Civil Service Commission, Commission on Elections, Commission on Audit, and Commission on Human Rights and the Office of the Ombudsman. These commissions may be abolished only uh, by means of impeachment. And this is one of the uh, weaknesses that uh, has driven the impression that the, uh, there is uh, no adherence to the constitutional provision, especially when it comes to this uh, uh, remedial measure of impeachment. Um, then we have also the perversity of setting aside the constitutional mandate uh, for expediency and convenience to attain political and personal agenda. The following uh, dysfunctional instances are mentioned as they exacerbate uh, the lamentable condition of government in the midst of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. In an attempt to marshal those who are not in agreement with the policy directions and personal driven agenda of public officers, the supremacy of the fundamental law of the land, the Constitution is subjugated to the revised rules of court, which is the one that defines the co waranto, the famous co waranto. In, the, in the, the context of democracy, the co waranto petition became the aggressor. The, this petition enabled the state to destroy an institution well enshrined, enshrined in the fundamental law of the land. The third nature of public office is not that it is not a contract. As the legislative body has failed to pass an anti-dynasty law under Article 2, Declaration of Principles and State Policies, Section 26 thereof reads, the state shall guarantee equal access to opportunities for public service and political and prohibit political dynasties as may be defined by law. What is transparent? is the merry-go-round among husbands, wife, children, teams, and the recycling of public officers from one position to another without due process of law. Service to the people requires utmost responsibility, integrity, loyalty, and efficiency. Yet the current malpractice is the use of public office as reward to people who help in the political campaign of appointing authorities. This practice is a blatant disregard to the principle that the public office is not a personal property of those who are vested with the trust of the government. Recent examples of uh, this, this uh, uh, system are uh, numerous to be uh, enumerated, but uh, for uh, the enlightenment of the of the group and uh, witnesses, we have I have uh, uh, pointed out. I am pointing out several of these instances uh, as the. The recent scandal in the purchase of PPEs has uh, indicated that uh, the office is used as a purchasing entity, uh, not for the purpose of uh, serving the needs of the front line liners, but to patent the pockets of those who are in charge of uh, the purchasing. Uh, System. Another uh, instance is 
is the uh, transportation uh, system. The uh, system of uh, choosing the uh, Egypt against the traditional one uh, is favoring the uh, capital, uh, the biggest capital investors in the country to the detriment of the riding public and those who are engaged in the transportation of this uh, jeepney, traditional jeepney system that we have. Another uh, instance is the um, uh, purchase of uh, this, uh, another instance is the distribution of uh, the stuff or the social amelioration uh, program funds that were uh, provided for the poorest of the poor. Uh, the data being used is outdated. Uh, the basis for the BSWD in the distribution of the funds uh, is of uh, 2015 vintage. And it resulted to the exclusion of 5 million more families meaning to say that uh, all together with the 18 million of the DSWD uh, data, you add 5 uh, million more which were included in the first sub uh, distribution, we will have 23 million families to be served. But considering that uh, our uh, population is only 109 million, where would the funds go uh, in the average of uh, more than uh, 5 million uh, families go? It will certainly be uh, in the uh, pockets of those who are in charge of uh, the distribution of the sub funds. But this is already um, affirmed in the report of 22,000 people who are uh, to be investigated uh, by the uh, DS, by the um, Department of Justice because they are involved in the corruption of the distribution of the sub funds. And then there is this uh, uh, modified learning of uh, instruct, uh, modified uh, learning uh, system that is being introduced. And from uh, reliable sources, while there is a real need of improving and introducing additional facilities and utilities in order to uh, have a connectivity that is really um, needed. If this uh, program is going to be successful, uh, the last, the, there are so many uh, constraints that they encounter. First, the LGUs where they are uh, trying to put up uh, the facilities uh, to improve the connectivity system are uh, demanding for excessive uh, out-of-pocket expenses. Aside from the numerous requirements that they impose to make this, uh, to make the program uh, difficult for them to be able to uh, uh, come up with the solution of uh, this uh, deficiency in the uh, educational system that we have. So this is the reason why we are not able to uh, improve the connectivity system of our country. <clears throat> and, excuse me, and I can recite so many more. We have also this uh, 
uh, threat of the uh, gypsy drivers who are uh, clamoring that they be returned to their uh, trade. Yet, uh, they are listed as uh, in the waiting list or they are uh, just uh, given promises and so they are threatening to burn uh, the chips uh, because of the fear that uh, very soon their franchises will be cancelled. Uh, I can uh, recite so many more, but uh, due to time constraints, I would like just to read the uh, things that uh, we need to consider. Firstly, uh, this pandemic uh, uh, crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, disease, is a very new one. And considering uh, the uh, spread that it has uh, covered uh, almost uh, all of the uh, countries in this uh, globe, uh, I believe that the solution is, among other things, should include the health system and above all, I think we have to uh, remember that all these things will not happen if we are uh, only uh, if we are uh, connected uh, with the right uh, uh, perspective of how uh, to handle uh, this uh, problem uh, once we are in government service. Above all. I think the solution is we have to be right with our uh, Lord Almighty. We have to uh, practice the righteousness that uh, he has prescribed in uh, the scriptures, that the righteousness is the uh, road to um, making the nation uh, great and not uh, by uh, means of power, authority, and uh, any other unrighteousness that the leaders of the country have to think about. So for that matter, I would invite uh, our uh, listeners and uh, uh, to direct them to the uh, Commandments in the uh, in the Bible, so that uh, we will be able to have some uh, peace of mind, and uh, because we are already fully warned of what are the things that will happen henceforth. Thank you very much. And good day. thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge Dali. So, for everybody, Judge Dali, I believe, is one of the the founding members of Transparency International. Thank you both for, for sharing uh, with us the importance of the values of transparency and accountability, especially now that we're faced with all of these, with all of these, uh, with this uncertainty and, and these challenges. Uh, so thank you, Judge Dali. Uh, next up, we have Jose Solomon Cortez. Solomon Cortez who's the former executive director of Integrity, of the Integrity Initiative. He's the project coordinator of Business Integrity or uh, PACS, which is Partners for Accountability, Clean, Transparent, and Sustainable Enterprises, and of course, uh, of the UNDP Philippines. Uh, so, Mr. Cortez, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's see. Sir? Yeah. Hello. Good morning. Hello, yes, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you some of the programs and projects that we're uh, currently implementing in the UN Development Program country office here in the Philippines. So uh, without much ado and in the interest of time, uh, let me share some slides with you.
So um, in 2018, the UNDP, uh, with support from the UK government, launched the regional project called Promoting a Fair Business Environment in ASEAN or Fair Biz here in Southeast Asia under the New Prosperity Fund. Um, in cooperation with the UK government, uh, the project aims to promote fair, transparent, and predictable business environments in ASEAN countries by working with government, civil society, and the business sector. And it strives to foster a level playing field for business competition where uh, we promote a culture of transparency and integrity in the public and private sectors. And uh, responsible and sustainable business practices are encouraged and corruption risks are minimized and the application of justice is fair. And the way to do this is to have cross-sector collaboration. And uh, the way to implement this is, uh, uh, the vision is to have a business environment where we can enjoy decent work and inclusive growth, innovative and sustainable business practices, quality infrastructure and services, and then increase in foreign direct investment with sustainable impacts. But as I've said, we cannot do it uh, alone. And that's why we are fostering collaboration between government, uh, business sector, civil society, and the academe. And uh, the objective is to accelerate progress towards the sustainable development goals, particularly five, uh, which includes uh, SDG five, gender equality, SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, SDG 10, Reduce Inequalities, and uh, SDG 16, where our anti-corruption work is, uh, is lodged, uh, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions. And lastly, uh, to achieve all this, we need Partnerships for the Goals, which is under SDG 17. So the Fair Base Project's four priority areas are uh, covered in these four uh, pillars, uh, namely forging stronger partnerships between government and the private sector. Another is reforming procurement and infrastructure. Third is promoting sustainable business practices. And last is strengthening anti-corruption, accountability, and judicial mechanisms. So why in ASEAN? Uh, the business case is basically uh, uh, why the fair business concentrating in the region is that uh, this is a high growth area uh, where there's a combined gross domestic uh, product of US dollar uh, 2.9 trillion, uh, sixth largest uh, worldwide. This is based on figures uh, from the IMF in 2018 and it's a leading destination for FBIs where in 2017, a total of $137 billion came in to the region. And it's now the fourth most popular investment destination globally. But as uh, pointed out earlier, and I've also noticed uh, Dr. Magno uh, highlighting the figures in the most recent uh, CPI uh, ranking, uh, here in ASEAN, uh, eight of the 10 countries are uh, scored below the 50 uh, average or the global average. And the uh, average score is 41.6. But this is based on the CPI ranking in 2018. And um, recent survey results show that widespread corruption and ineffective laws and regulations are the greatest concern for the region based on the ASEAN Business Outlook survey in 2018. And another recent survey conducted by uh, TI uh, among the Asia Pacific youth, uh, it was noted that uh, in the Asia Pacific region, 30% of uh, the youth surveys have personally experienced corruption in the last 12 months. This is uh, an alarming figure by itself and to couple that with another survey result uh, coming from the WEF, uh, the same demographic, uh, particularly the millennials, said 74% of, uh, of them uh, perceive corruption as holding back their, their country. So with that, uh, the Fair Base is now uh, concentrating its support to six uh, ASEAN countries, 
namely Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, and of course the Philippines with the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative as an implementing partner. And uh, the hope is uh, we go beyond uh, compliance and uh, to employ collaboration and collective action to do effective anti-corruption work. That's why at the regional level, there's a couple of initiatives uh, they are implementing. They have organized a private sector, private sector advisory group as uh, one of the platforms for knowledge sharing and collaborative action. Uh, the other three are uh, the Fairbiz uh, Lab. Also, the development of uh, toolkits for uh, young entrepreneurs and startups, as well as uh, conducting programs for gender equal leadership. So going back to the four pillars, uh, just like to go over some of the projects that we are implementing here in the Philippines, particularly on how we are supporting uh, citizen monitoring efforts and risk assessments done by uh, uh, national procuring agencies. In the past two decades, uh, the Philippines saw uh, some reforms actually being done in this area particularly on the improvement and on the utilization and modernization of the Philippine government electronic procurement system. And this is where we are uh, focusing our work, uh, providing technical assistance for uh, the Department of Budget and Management, the Government Procurement and uh, Policy Board Technical uh, Support Office, the Department of Education, the DILG and the DOH as the three pilot agencies where, where we are rolling out the three uh, main activities, particularly the development of a procurement internal control framework and adoption of a risk-based procurement model. Second is the enhanced procurement information system for the GPP BTSO for monitoring and better decision making. And lastly, as noted earlier, uh, improving the uh, space for CSO participation so they can be involved in the whole uh, public financial management cycle uh, to improve transparency and service delivery outcomes. This is our work with the uh, public and uh, civil society sectors. Now I'm going to our work with the private sector, which I am uh, personally uh, coordinating. And this is in, uh, under the third pillar uh, promoting business integrity and good corporate governance in the business sector through innovative and multi-stakeholder solutions for sustainable development. So with support from the Prosperity Fund, we are implementing the Business Integrity PACS project or Partners for Accountable, Clean, Transparent, and Sustainable Enterprises. And uh, this complements the other two pillars. Uh, one is uh, fostering partnerships between the public and private sectors as well as civil society at the regional level to implement and monitor integrity policies in ASEAN. And the fourth pillar, uh, strengthening anti-corruption laws, policies, and strategies, improving redress mechanisms for businesses and the broader public by promoting court excellence. So in this slide, you can see that uh, the Fairbase program uh, is supporting a number of initiatives and activities across the six uh, ASEAN countries. And the Philippines is, uh, as I've said, working on uh, certain uh, programs to improve uh, public financial management and uh, adoption of uh, responsible business practices in the private sector. And we hope to share the results and outcomes of our activities with our counterparts in ASEAN. Hopefully we can uh, do this uh, cross sharing of uh, best practices and adopt each other's uh, experiences to improve our anti-corruption uh, uh, programs. So uh, I'll just skim over what Integrity Pacts wants to achieve in the coming months. Uh, basically we want to focus on addressing unethical business practices and minimize leakages in private to private business contracts by adopting a standard code of conduct for doing business among micro and small uh, medium enterprises. 
who often do not have uh, the same resources and capabilities as large companies. They are also uh, overwhelmingly the majority of economic uh, activity that's uh, being uh, done here in uh, ASEAN, particularly here in the Philippines, and provides a large chunk of employment to the local uh, population. And the objective is to enhance industry-wide business integrity practices through first the development and promotion of adoption of standard integrity indicators among SMEs and exploring possible application of uh, technology, particularly blockchain for procurement and supply chain management. Four activities here are the uh, conduct of a business integrity baseline study, uh, development of uh, standard integrity indicators and the self-assessment tool. And lastly, uh, development of business integrity training modules uh, for pilot testing among uh, volunteer SMB uh, uh, companies in workshops to be held in uh, the coming months. This is basically a snapshot of what we're trying to do with the research on blockchain. Uh, for the business integrity study, we are working with the AIM, the UN Global Compact, and the PCCI to come up with uh, common integrity practices that local value chains can adopt, uh, as well as business partners of Philippine conglomerates. Uh, blockchain research is being conducted by the Makati Business Club. Uh, we are partnering with them to uh, conduct this study. Hopefully, we will be able to present the results of the study in the coming weeks, so watch out for that. And for integrity, for activity three, we have integrity indicators uh, being uh, implemented by the integrity initiative, uh, as well as the fourth activity, the development of the self-assessment tool, uh, which we hope will identify vulnerabilities of SMEs and address potential uh, areas uh, of interventions to help address gaps and leakages. And lastly, the training module for uh, pilot testing among vendors and business partners of large conglomerates. And uh, again, this is to address the vulnerabilities and gaps resulting from their uh, taking the self-assessment tool also being implemented by the Integrity Initiative. Among the impact and results are the three bullet points enumerated here. Uh, we hope that uh, SMEs undergoing the program will adopt the business code of conduct uh, that we are developing. The second is that uh, SMEs have integrated acceptable business integrity anti-corruption practices in their core business and have aligned their policies, processes, systems, and practices with globally accepted corporate governance principles. And lastly, to have uh, succeeding survey, surveys show improvements, uh, especially in the prevalence of bribery and level of corruption. And with that, uh, I'll end my presentation now and uh, address uh, uh, questions that will come in the open forum. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cortez. It's nice to know that there are organizations, initiatives like yours that not only work with the private and public sector, but also at the regional level. So thank you for sharing those uh, that slide deck with us. Um, uh, next up, we have the president of Action for Economic Reforms, Ms. Jessica Reyes Campos. Campos Reyes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Are you here? Uh, yes, I, I am. Jessica, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm, Good morning, Paco. Thank you for the invitation. It is indeed a privilege to be part of this panel, and uh, no less than my idol, uh, Supreme Court Justice and former Ombudsman Conchita Carpio Morales uh, with us. So uh, I'd like to have a picture with her later. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, too for Stratbase uh, ADR for, for this invitation. I didn't expect that we have a full panel of very distinguished uh, speakers. I am here as president of Action for Economic Reforms. Uh, Action for Economic Reforms does research and advocacy work on fiscal reforms, industrial policy, freedom of information, 
and of late food security and agriculture development. The topic we have today is very interesting, transparency and accountability, regaining public trust through democratic governance. Let me begin with a quote from our president. Your concern is human right. Mine is human lives. So went a line that reverberated in the president's July 2018 sauna. We all know that that line sent chills down the spine of human rights advocates. No thanks to COVID, the human rights versus human lives mantra took on a new dimension. Pitted against an individual's right to simply go to the grocery and shop, travel to work, assemble for a mass expression of disgust, these rights were suddenly trumped by indeed human lives, public health, if you will. For several months now, I bet majority of us in this virtual town hall grudgingly accepted and lived with the curtail curtailment of these rights as indeed public health is at stake. The libertarians amongst us took comfort with the thought, may ayuda naman or the social amelioration program that will be forthcoming for vulnerable sectors of our society. But as we all plodded along the war against COVID, we find a very fundamental human right as very much one thing, our right to information. It is not simply a right to any kind of information, but the right to timely, digestible, and accurate information for our citizens. I emphasize accurate many time, times over. We in Action for Economic Reforms have been in the Right to Know campaign ever since our organization was founded some 24 years ago. Freedom of Information, or FOI, as we in the Right to Know Right Now Coalition call it, is a key ingredient in a thriving democracy. Information empowers citizens to be active partners of development rather than simply beneficiaries or tagaintay lang. Beneficiaries of trickle-down, top-down approach to development. Allow me to expound a bit more on what my good friend from college days, Kiko Magno and Coco Alcuas, one of our active partners in the Right to Know Coalition, initially shared and reiterate some points with regard to FOI as a key ingredient in regaining the public's trust and strengthening democratic governance. Number one, it is important to have access to digestible and processable information. Hindi po, sim hindi po enough na, oh, ayan ang full disclosure policy portal, bahala ka na. And that those are just token submissions. If you do, if, you, if, if LGUs, local government, uh, units submit PDF formats. The, these are not machine read readable formats, and it will make a, it will take a lot of time for people to re-encode and process this information. So it has to be digestible quickly. And I cannot uh, overemphasize the keyword of access, internet access, at in this day and age, farmers, teachers, workers, students. They should be the ones to give, to be given primary access to internet. Not doing so will widen the gap within the rich and the poor. And I, uh, it, it, we, we, AER is actually wish to call on on the DICT and even the NTC, as there are things that are quickly actionable and hindi na kailangan ng action ng Congress. Quickly, the executive can, do, can mandate the DICT to do emergency procurement of internet service providers so that schools, hospitals, uh, clinics, uh, uh, barangay halls can, can have access to internet. The, the, the executive can also mandate the sharing of facilities like towers and passive infrastructures. These things can be quickly done without Congress action. The ICT just have to, to act. Second, access is not enough. Knowing how to process and use the information is equally important. Sure, um, Kiko mentioned data analytics, but first and foremost, our citizens must be able to think for themselves. If our citizens have access to information and they know how to process it, 
they should be the first one to be able to engage their local governments and demand transparency, demand accountability based on the information that is there. And I, we cannot overemphasize the critical role of education at this time. We cannot let our children, our future, our future lag behind. My next three points would, would deal on the culture of participative and civilized engagement. We need a, active citizenship. Oftentimes people tend to simply leave matters to elected officials and shy away from speaking out and sharing their analysis. Parang, oh, ayan na si mayor, trabaho na ni mayor yang magsilbe. Uh, Inelect ko na siya. Pero at this day and age, engagement is very much important. Let's be active citizens. Ano po ang silbi ng freedom ng information ng armas na yan if we do not use it? Next point on developing a culture of participation. Citizens must know how to engage in, in critical engagement and critical collaboration is important. Knowing when to participate, how, and with whom. Magminsan po kasi too late the hero na tayo pag, 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 uh, pag kailangang participate. How many of us have participated in uh, barangay town hall meetings when, when the barangays do their reporting? And uh, government's relationship with NGOs and, peace and CSO should not always be adversarial. There must be confidence building measures from both ends that would foster critical collaboration and engagement. Next point on culture. Yung elected officials po natin, they must, they must have a sense of, they, they must not have a sense of entitlement that they have the exclusive right to information. I remember one friend who suddenly got elected as concejal, and I was so happy to, te, to congratulate him. I said, Oi, uh, sige di, magbibigay ka na sa mga constituents mo ng kopya ng budget ordinance ninyo. And I was disheartened to, when, on his reply, he said, Aba, eh maging konsehal muna sila bago nila makita yung ordinansa. I mean, this, this false sense of entitlement among elected officials should never find space in a democratic governance setup. And uh, while we're on it and it's difficult now to monitor what Congress is doing. There should be open online public hearings of all legislative bodies. May Facebook Live naman. Uh, and not just the session hall, how it's happening in the session hall. It's important to monitor the public hearings that's going on in committee levels. Some congressional committees choose not to have that uh, done on public. And, uh, Bawal po sana ang pikon sa mga elected leaders natin. If there's pikon, eh, you tend to dismiss people who do not agree with you. Ma mahirap po. Uh, my next last two points will deal on the strengthening of institutions of participation. There should be functioning platforms for real participation. For instance, there should be functional local school boards now that we are trying to grapple with providing education uh, to our children. And it is crucial that those who sit as NGO representatives are not the kind where the mayors get to choose, pick and choose sino yan. Because those who, who, who sit in those special boards should have some sort of independence. Um, and the last point, there should be sanctions for the curtailment of people's right to participate. Sure, there's the local government code that uh, provides for platforms for participation, pero wala pong sanctions eh, pag the mayor chooses to disregard, disaccredit, choose not to accredit uh, an, an NGO or, or a PO that wishes to participate. Sanctions such as this need to be legislated. It should be done by law. Hindi po pwede moral situation lang. Our advocacy to have the freedom of information nationally legislated continues to be on the side 
continues. Our advocacy continues for FOI to be legislated. But we try to work on islands of good governance by celebrating little victories when we see LGUs that have their own enacted local FOI ordinance. Meron na pong mga ano, local governments that have local FOI ordinance. And we thank the Presidential Commission Communications Operations Office and the DILG for adding the enactment of an FOI ordinance in the criteria for award of the seal of good local governance. But for sure, we wish Congress to do its share and enact the long overdue FOI law. Nobody said democracy is easy. Sometimes it might even slow down decision-making processes. But we in Action for Economic Reforms would rather work our way toward achieving democratic governance anytime than be saddled with another dictatorship all over again. God bless our country and our people. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ma'am Jessica. Thank you for that. Uh, that Ma'am Jessica just actually uh, was our last speaker for, for this morning, and we actually now have some time since we do still have a, a lot of participants with us uh, for some Q&A. Um, the first one, may I ask our main speaker, Justice Scarpio Morales, if she's, uh, if she's up for it? Yes, ma'am. Hi, good, uh, good, uh, good morning, ma'am. We, we have a question here uh, directed to you. And the question is, uh, you mentioned earlier that anti-corruption efforts should not go slow and soft even amidst the pandemic. Uh, what are the hopes, what are your hopes for the Ombudsman probe on alleged uh, irregularities in the DOH's COVID-19 response? And how will the outcome of this investigation affect public trust? Your thoughts, Bob. All right. Uh, I am fortunate to have left uh, uh, with the office of the Ombudsman, um, senior engineer officials, uh, who are, well, I would say, people of integrity and who cannot be called by outside influence. So um, given the apparent um, passion of the present uh, team of investigators uh, dwelling on the um, alleged uh, irregularities attendant to the discharge of office by the uh, Department of Health, uh, I would suppose that they'll come up with uh, a fair report and fair recommendation. So, uh, irrespective of uh, the uh, announcement by the president that he still believes in the integrity of the Secretary of Health, it has nothing to do with the integrity of the Secretary of Health. It has something to do with the alleged irregularities in the system itself. That's my answer. Yeah, thanks, ma'am. Thank you for that. Uh, I actually have one more question here for you, but I think I should address it to everybody because uh, it, the question here uh, is moving forward, what immediate actions do you think the civil society sector can take to advance the anti-corruption movement in this time of crisis? So, of course, uh, Justice Carpio Morales, you're, you're welcome to answer that. It was for a question for you. But I also invite anybody else, any other of our speakers to, to talk about this as well. I know that some of us already have, but if you have any additional points that you want to add, uh, you're very much welcome. Let's give a chance to the other speakers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Is there anybody else want to talk about the uh, civil society and the role? I think uh, Dr. Magno was talking earlier about the role of the different sectors in society in open governance and transparency and accountability. Perhaps you might want to share your, some, some, some thoughts on that. Uh, yes, Papo, certainly uh, in this uh, health crisis that we are facing, uh, a lot of uh, emergency measures, uh, not only in the Philippines, but around the world, uh, uh, required, required the use of extra budgetary funds. So, which means that these are funds that are not in the General Appropriations Act. Uh, precisely uh, in these times, we need uh, strong monitoring. Uh, of course, we have legislative oversight. So, uh, my friend uh, Jessica 
Cantos already mentioned the importance really of uh, of monitoring, and I think uh, this is an opportunity for for uh, civil society organizations to participate in uh, in budgetary processes and even in legislative processes, uh, especially if. Uh, the legislature goes online. I understand the Senate has really gone online. So uh, there have been constraints in the past for civil society to participate because they cannot be in the session hall. But uh, it might be good for the legislative branch to open opportunities for e-participation. Uh, there is already an effort, even in a local government like South Cotabato, uh, they enrolled uh, an open legislation program under the Open Government Partnership. So uh, perhaps uh, we can take note of this opportunity to participate. But of course, uh, uh, in the past, physical presence was constrained by funding requirements. Of course, you need to, to, uh, to uh, carry the cost of participation. There are also costs in online platforms and, and that's internet access. So uh, I would say that there is a real need to, for civil society to engage in the monitoring process, including uh, fund monitoring. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Magna. I think Judge, Judge Dali, are you? Uh, yes, thank you very you much. You about to say something? Okay, but yes, but. I would like to share my experience in this regard. I believe that uh, to have an independent monitoring machinery, there should be a cohesion among civil society organizations or uh, specifically some NGOs like the NGO uh, put up by Manang Pura because they, we can do the uh, field work that Congress or uh, any uh, agency for that matter cannot do because they are protecting of their own reputation. They are uh, in the habit of uh, showing that they are better than the other uh, government agencies, which is destructive in the sense that uh, it is not a contest of what they can do, but it is the uh, transparency of what they have done that is more important. And the civil society organizations or the NGOs in particular can very well do this because we are grounded in the uh, uh, advocacy that we have, which is covering not only the government, but more specifically the population in general. So thank you very much for that. Thanks, Judge Yeah, indeed, you know, uh, with that, you know, Judge Jolly was talking about the need for a cohesive uh, movement from civil society to address these issues. And then Dr. Magna was talking about, of course, now that we're, we've gone digital, that uh, we now have the opportunity to do that through the internet. And that's also why I was writing for the Institute um, in Philstar, and I actually, I wrote there that the gathering, that the internet technology is no longer just the means of gathering people, like radio and, and uh, text was for EDSA 1 and 2 in the past, but the internet is actually where people gather. Um, so now that, you know, and I mm -hmm. noticed also that a lot of our speakers were talking about that, um, the role of technology, the role of e-governance. So now I go back to, uh, to Dr. Ona, who uh, I did uh, warn earlier, I was going to come back to talk about uh, Hello, sir. Yeah, about e governance. And I actually have a question here for you uh, for Dr. Sherwin Ona, but of course, everybody is welcome to, to respond. Uh, do you have uh, the use of data and digital tools to build public institutions? Do you have recommendations for the use of data and digital tools to build public institutions and e governance? And are there any policy issues that? should be addressed from your perspective. Okay. Can I just add to what uh, Dr. Magno uh, shared a while ago? Sure, sir, but it's a bit uh, uh, quiet. I think you have to, the microphone. Hello, or something. can you hear me? Hello, sir. Hello. All right. 
Yeah, slightly better. Yes, po. Okay, is this better? Yes. Yeah. Much, I just much. want to. I just want to add to what Dr. Magno uh, said a while ago about uh, e-participation. Yes, um, I agree that um, technology can give uh, the much-needed access to uh, civil society. However, I would like to bring in the idea of uh, digital transformation, and this might, you know, partially answer your 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 concern, Paco. No? Um, not really, yeah, uh, having access to, to um, technologies or expanding your access is a good thing. But um, uh, the presence of new technologies would really um, encourage people to challenge old models. Uh, like for instance, um, yes, we have access, but do we, do we really, uh, do we really uh, leverage the use of data? That's one, that's one aspect of having technology is having data as well, right? But do we really use it to, to pursue uh, data-driven policies or evidence-based policy making? And um, to answer your, your question, Paco, regarding uh, do we have enough policies? Um, I think we do. We have enough laws to, to guarantee, for example, interoperability. But again, the challenge here is more on the implementation. Yes, we have these laws that uh, mandates, for example, creation of digital registries, creation of portals. But if, if you will look at these policies, these are merely um, uh, uh, automating what is existing. Uh, what is missing, I believe, is really to, to leverage on what technology can bring or can give. And this requires some sort of a digital transformation paradigm, you know? uh, re-examining what we're doing right now, re-examining our current models, and uh, try to figure out the right solution. And this solution can come in the form of technology, but definitely technology alone will not guarantee effective solution. It requires, uh, you know, uh, principles of good governance. It requires participation. It requires agile institutions, institutions that can adjust to the new normal. We cannot do the things that we have been doing for the past years as we enter the new normal environment. Thank you. Great. Uh I completely agree. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, actually, we are uh, a bit over time, but I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So I, I hope if you do have something to share that uh, now is the time uh, to do it. But uh, really, I think maybe as a last question, just moving forward, uh, that you know, transparency and accountability, yes, we've discussed the, the value of it the importance of these values, these democratic values, especially now that there's, we're in the middle of a pandemic that we should not be forgotten or put to the side. Uh, but moving forward, uh, how big of an issue do you think or how big of a, of a concern will, will transparency and accountability play as we move towards, let's say, uh, an election in 2022? And what's the role, perhaps, if others want to talk about the role of technology, we governance in that, it's also fine as well. But uh, really, uh, anybody uh, would, uh, would be welcome to, to share their thoughts on the road ahead. Hi, Paco. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, thank you for recognizing me. Um, in with regard to the forthcoming elections, this is one of the things, this is actually my, one of my personal advocacies. And again, it's, um, it's a toss up between the constitutional right of someone to run for public office versus the right of the people to really find out who you are and how you think and what is your vision. I, I actually would want to push for um, making sure, putting into law uh, for someone who wants to, who, who seeks public office to, to participate in public debates and uh, organized by, by church groups, NGOs, community leaders. Put yourself out there and line yourself up against your, uh, your, your content, the other, your opponents in, in, in politics and find out how, 
exchange each other's ideas and put out your platform. What are your promises? And it's, it's something, uh, and not doing so, if you do not show up in the debate, without a very good excuse like you had COVID or what, you shouldn't, you should, you have no right at all to seek public office. For sure, the people who, who, who are familiar with the constitu constitution would say, hey, that's, that's not, know, you are curtailing the right of someone to seek public office. Ito lang naman yung mga batayan eh, you have to, uh, I mean, you have to be a Filipino citizen, etc. But now, at this time, people have to know what, how you think, what you intend to do, and how, how you are going to go about it. So coming into elections, I wish, if, if, if it's not legislated, at the minimum, our church leaders and community leaders should demand that people who seek public office put yourself out there and not... Uh, win by defaulting and just giving money out. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ma'am Jessica. Anybody else want to share some thoughts? Uh, because uh, Paso, if not, then... Ah, Paso, yes, I, that, judge. I would like yes, to uh, share my thoughts regarding reforms in the election process. I think it okay. is really good if we can have a public screening of who the candidates to vote for in this coming election because leadership is very important in our democratic system. So um, my thought is if the, there will be a body, an independent body composed of uh, NGOs with similar advocacies, we can uh, have a, we can draw the guidelines of how to select the candidates that we can recommend to the com complex, not just uh, by receiving the applications for uh, candidacy, and that is it. So I think uh, in order to screen the kind of leaders that we are going to elect, we should have this independent body that should be the one to recommend uh, who were those who uh, were screened and qualified for the uh, leadership that we need in the country. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Zali. Thank you. Indeed, yes. Indeed, that would be a useful thing to have, especially in the time of social media, and you can have access to all of the uh, all of this information about who's running. That would indeed be something uh, useful for the coming election. Uh, so if, uh, if no one else has questions or would like to share some thoughts, uh, perhaps I can close the, we are 25 minutes over, over time. So I was thinking that we could, we could close today's uh, session. Thank you so much to everybody uh, for attending. Um, I will now pass on the mic, so to speak, to our president, Professor Dean Dillon Hitt. I, uh, who on the program says he will give the closing remarks. If, unless you would want me to close it, uh, then. Happy to leave it with Paco as, a, <laughs> as Democracy Watch uh, lead convener and somebody who started Democracy Watch with me when he was a young graduate from UP in the early part, uh, maybe seven to eight years ago. So Paco, maybe raise some uh, points that, uh, on, on some of your advocacy yeah. on the democracy watch. Yeah. Sure. Well, well, that's it. First of all, I'd like to thank all of our guests and speakers who, who attended. Uh, first, Honorable Kajita Harpio Morales, our friends from the Academy and Civil Society, thank you for, for being here. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor when had said, uh, yes, I, I am here as as both ADRI and Democracy Watch. Democracy Watch is an advocacy group where really what we are advocating is good governance and, and uh, electoral reform. And of course, part of that is really pushing, for example, today, uh, advocating for transparency and accountability in governments, governance, but also we also want uh, responsive governance, which requires uh, responding effic efficiently and effectively to the needs of, of citizens on the ground, as well as the rule of law, like Dr. Uh, Rather than those I mentioned earlier, and not the rule by law, which 
unfortunately we've been seeing uh, but more than a bit of in, in the past few years. Uh, but really, and that's why I thank everybody for, for joining us here today to discuss uh, transparency and accountability and uh, regaining public trust through the democratic, uh, democratic governance. It was a very insightful uh, discussion and uh, I thank you and wish uh, to see you all very soon. Uh, stay safe and uh, take care. Thank you, thank you for attending. Bye-bye, congratulations everybody. Thank you all for thank being you. Behind, behind the scenes for organizing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.